So you've heard me talking about it. You know, which cancers do I see? I keep saying Hodgkin's lymphoma and head and neck cancer because you know, I've been here for nearly 10 years and that's what I see. Those are far and away my biggest groups. I have between 100 and 200 Hodgkin survivors and I have no idea how many head and neck cancer patients that I'm actively taking care of. Sarcomas are rare. I see them because we're at Sloan Kettering and if you have a sarcoma you know, in the middle of New Jersey and nobody else could even read the pathology on it, they tend to get sent here. And there's a couple of guys who you know, do all the sarcomas and they're really, really, really good at it because it's very specialized. So guess what? I get to see a lot of sarcomas. But still pales in comparison to these. Breast cancer. You know, the radiation fibrosis from breast cancer is relatively minimal. As I said before, we're really good at the radiation there. It tends to be just kind of fibrosis of the breast, right, lymphedema, chest wall tightness. Unless something bad happened, like you had a recurrence, in which case you can get, like that patient I showed you earlier, all sorts of bad things happen as a result of the radiation. Spinal metastases, another place that I, I commonly see because we take those out and then we give them radiation and the surgery and the radiation often causes a lot of paraspinal spasms. But then I see from metastatic cancers, and again, we're talking largely about survivors, but in metastatic cancers, it can kind of go anywhere. Depending on what treatment we had to provide, if it includes radiation, I'll see mononeuropathies of, say, the sciatic nerve and severe pain and weakness as a result of it just because your prostate cancer had the, the bad manners to go to an area where to get at it, we had to involve the sciatic nerve in the radiation field. You know, and, and we take those sort of as they come. But those are fortunately relatively rare compared to all of the, you know, very long-lived Hodgkin survivors and head and neck cancer patients we have because, you know, they did survive their primary cancer. Also out of the textbook, this is the fields for Hodgkin's disease, and this is very important. So up here, and actually I'll just show you here, is the mantle field. This is most common. Hodgkin's is a B-cell lymphoma that usually starts um, in the mediastinal lymph nodes, but it can start down here as well. And the idea of the radiation was to radiate all the lymph nodes above the diaphragm in what we call early stage Hodgkin's disease, and these were our first survivors. So to do that, you have to give very high doses of radiation to a very extensive field called the mantle field. Now, interestingly, they would often, it doesn't show it in this, but they would often actually show it here, shield the thyroid, and very importantly, shield the lungs, because the lungs were so sensitive to the radiation. Now, the lungs still get a little bit out in the periphery and where they touch with the mediastinum, so it wasn't perfect. Particularly, it wasn't perfect in 1965 or 1975. But they made an attempt, so they'd put shields, usually lead, over the lungs to shield them. Now, if you're Hodgkin's, and we used to do, before we had all these great CT scanners and MRIs, we'd have to flay you open to see where your Hodgkin's was, right? You'd have a staging laparoscopy to see if the Hodgkin's was in and around the aorta. And if it was, they'd remove it, right? They might remove, remove your spleen while they were there, just for good measure. Um, and then they would radiate the paraaortic and the ilioinguinal lymph nodes. So that's the aortic, and these are the inguinal vessels, or these are inguinal, these are ilioinguinal, and these are inguinal. And if they did all of this, for obviously reasons, they called it inverted Y radiation, right? If you had everything done, that was total nodal irradiation. So remember, the complications of the radiation really are based on how much of you was radiated, right? So if you just had the mantle, well, that's bad enough, certainly, but you won't get radiation complications below the diaphragm. If you had everything, all bets are off. You can have any number of things as a result of it. So this was actually one of my first patients, not here, very good guy who's given me photos many times over the years. I gotta write another big chapter, so any Hodgkin survivors in the room, when I see you again, I'm probably gonna be taking your picture from the back. Just giving you fair warning, <laughs> if you'll let me. Because I wanna kinda put a composite, because they all end up looking the same, with various degrees. This guy's kind of a buffed guy, you see his big, you know, pretty big triceps, he had big biceps. But what you see is, the spine here shouldn't be that prominent. This is called the supraspinatus muscle. This is the infraspinatus muscle and the rhomboids here. And you shouldn't see that on an otherwise very well-developed man. That's all very atrophic. And guess what he showed up with the first time I saw him? Shoulder pain, which is classic. And I'll talk about why they get shoulder pain in a minute. So I told you I'd kind of go through the, the myelopathy, the myeloradiculoplexoneuromyopathy 
piece by piece. The myelopathy, the spinal cord damage, and I haven't been able to corroborate this because this reference saying that it's 15% of Hodgkin's survivors, which I think is probably right, didn't give another reference to tell me where he got the, that number. So I can't quote the study it came from, except that it came out of this paper. And that can look like any number of things. I have patients who are spastic, right? They like a stroke patient or, or somebody else who'd had a spinal cord injury patient. They can have pain from it. They can have gait problems from it, et cetera, et cetera. This is actually showing you a spinal cord. It shouldn't look bright white inside it like that. This is a patient who developed myelopathy from the radiation. In this case, a prostate cancer patient. Radiculopathy, damage to the nerve roots. The nerve roots are after the spinal cord. The nerve has to exit the spine, right? So when you have sciatica, it's usually damage to a nerve root. We have no idea what the incidence of this is. What we do commonly see is the upper cervical nerve roots in, at C5 and 6 in my Hodgkin's patients and my head and neck cancer patients are most commonly affected. The reason for that is just anatomy, right? Those roots are longer. They have less connective tissue over them. In the case of the head and neck cancer patients, they may have been the inferior part, the lowest part of where they radiated. And this is showing you, so this is a spine, right? Here's your spinal cord. This is the dura mater that lines the spinal cord. And these are the bones, right? This is the nerve root. It would come out, pierce through this, this arachnoid and come out through these little holes. And this is actually showing you where cancer can affect it. Cancer can affect coming in from the bone, that's epidural disease, or it can be leptomeningeal in the cerebral spinal fluid, or it can be inside the spinal cord itself. Now, interestingly, this is kind of, again, this is advanced class stuff. Even my residents don't all know this. So you guys are all going to be smart in my residents, at least for the three seconds that you can remember this. <laughs> um, leptomeningeal disease, and I'm coming to a point. When you get cancer inside the cerebral spinal fluid, it sort of lights up and causes these little nodularities when you give gadolinium enhancement. Interestingly, radiation looks the same, or can. I have, this was, uh, you know, a, a, a patient uh, actually with Hodgkin's disease who came, who got the periodic radiation, the inverted Y radiation, and was having foot drops and progressive difficulties with gait, and he was sent up to me from Florida by a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I actually MRI'd him, and, and he had these little nodules here. And he's not the only one. I have several patients who have this. And it's literally, you're seeing bits of the fibrosis affecting the spinal cords. It actually looks like cancer on the cord, but it's not. It's just nodular fibrosis. And that's just kind of describing. That's, that's even too heady for me. All right. Plexopathy. So the plexus, here, let me show you a plexus. Here's a plexus. So these are the nerve roots. They would form together, and this is, the, this is your chest, this is the brachial plexus up in your arm, this is the lumbar plexus, so this is your pelvis, and this is the lumbar, and the sacral, we call it collectively the lumbosacral plexus. So this is commonly damaged from the radiation. Remember, we shielded the lungs, which are down here, but we didn't shield the plexus at all. And these nerve roots are very long before they connect and become the upper part. So the upper part takes a very long course relative to this, which takes a very short course. So this gets a lot more relative radiation than this does, just because it's longer. Took a lot bigger hit. Um, and that's part of the reason why we see so much shoulder girdle weakness in the Hodgkin's patients and the head and neck cancer patients, because in a head and neck cancer patient, radiation may cut off down here. So you only get these, these nerve roots, and these don't get affected at all. So plexus is commonly damaged from radiation. Here you see a patient with breast cancer, and you actually see some swelling of the plexus here, which is from infiltration of tumor. But over here, here's one of my head and neck cancer patients, and these are the scalene muscles. And you see how this one is brighter than this one? This is uber advanced class, because this is like radiologists have trouble reading these. I have trouble reading these, and I try very hard. But this is indicative of damage from the radiation. Okay? And this is part of how we tell if you have a radiation-induced plexopathy. And this is one of the, unfortunately, secondary malignancies. And a patient actually got a sarcoma from his radiation. Okay. Neuropathy. I have no idea what the incidence is. But there's a lot of very important nerves, probably 100% in Hodgkin's patients. There's a lot of very important nerves on the chest wall, things that innervate all of your rotator cuff muscles of your shoulder. And they're smack dab in the middle of the radiation field. So they can often be affected. Myopathy. 
incidents, I'd say 100% in the Hodgkin survivors, probably 100% in the head and neck cancer survivors, and probably 100% in any other patient who received reasonably high doses of radiation that involved muscle. I think, you know, I, I have yet to stick a needle in a muscle and see it be completely normal after radiation. So we don't biopsy people often, but we know the muscle gets sick. And Carol Portlock and Patrick Boland and others, who are both here, uh, made me a lot smarter. By, and I really didn't even work with them on this at this time. This was back in 2003. I came here in 2001 by actually taking one of the Hodgkin's patients with neck drop, biopsying the muscles in their neck, and then biopsying a muscle out in their shoulder and comparing them. And what they saw was in the radiation field, they would get what's called nemalin rods. These are like deposits of gunk in the muscle that we see in certain types of myopathy, muscle sickness. And these are just some of the changes I see on EMG when I stick a muscle in there. So here you go again. Another Hodgkin's patient, you see his trapezius is, is relatively preserved, um, just the superior part of it, the upper part, but everything else is really atrophic, you know, and that's common. If I were to show you the backs of 100 Hodgkin survivors, they would all look like various degrees of this after, you know, 10 or 15 years, certainly. Head and neck cancer patients. Um, Again, we're now using different radiation. You know, back in the 1960s, radi you know, head and neck cancer patients really weren't going to live as a result of the treatment. We weren't as good at it back then. Now they actually tend to do very well. So we will radiate, and this is what's called a 100% isodose curve. So where the red is is where they got a high dose of radiation, and over here in blue, it's where they didn't get hardly any radiation at all. And what you see is we sculpt it around the spinal cords right here. So very fancy schmancy, we use those columnators to keep the spinal cord from getting a high dose of radiation. But everything else in the neck and the shoulder got a very high dose of radiation. And as a result of that, you damage a lot of very important structures. The neck's a very, very, very busy place with all sorts of things coming and going in there, any one of which is critical to life. So head and neck cancer patients can have a lot of problems as a result of the radiation. One of the biggest things is dystonia. So this young woman with uh, nasopharyngeal cancer post radiation, these are what's called the sternocleidomastoid muscles. And both the muscle and their nerve supply were involved in the radiation one degree or another, mostly the nerve supply, and they're just spasming. They're like iron and they just won't relax. So she's actually trying to lay her head down. You see the skin changes. You know, and this is several years after her radiation. She simply can't, the neck's just stuck as a result of the fibrosis. older lady, and this is another head and neck cancer patient with nasopharyngeal cancer. And what you see here is that these muscles are really, really atrophic. You see the scapula is out to the side, we call that winging, relative to the other side. And the reason for that, again, is she has a lot of arthritis in her neck. She's, I don't remember how old she was at this time, you know, in her 80s. And, uh, you know, as, as a result of having a lot of arthritis and then getting radiated over here, all of these muscles really just atrophied. As a result, so guess what she had? Neck weakness, shoulder pain. Very, very common things we see. So what is it about shoulder pain? Why, is, why do I keep talking about this? Well, all of the things we do, right? The fact that we operated on you, the fact that we poisoned you often with chemotherapeutics that are bad for the nerve, the fact that we gave you radiation, the fact that you're older or if you had a recurrence, any of these things can, da can damage, and this is, you know, again, the heady part, but this is important, those upper cervical nerve roots, C5 or 6, are that upper part of the brachial plexus, just like we've been talking about. Well, those are very key muscles. So if you have pinched nerves from whatever reason at C5 or 6, those nerves tend to radiate like sciatica to your lateral arm. So a lot of patients come in with arm, lateral arm pain. They also work the rotator cuff muscles, right? So now you have nerve pain on the outside of your arm, Weaken rotator cuff muscles, it tends to move your shoulder out of position, so now you start pinching it. You're not moving it, it's weak, it's painful, you pinch it, so what do you get? You get tendonitis, and if you get inflammation of the shoulder, you get an adhesive capsulitis, you get a frozen shoulder. So I see this again and again and again from breast cancer, from Hodgkin's, from head and neck cancer, and just because it's Wednesday. I mean, normal people get this, right? So th this isn't something unique. To, to cancer patients, this is something that's dime a dozen for rehab doctors all over the world. The treatment, fortunately, is relatively the same. You know, in patients very 
compromised by radiation, we have to fight against the radiation, but we're usually able to make most patients much better. This is a pay, uh, another one of those radiation dose curves I was showing you for a patient with a prod and malignancy. This is his head, and this is you know, the upper side of his face. There's a lot of important stuff in there, like the muscles that you chew with. When that happens, those muscles you chew with become very tight, they spasm, and he's trying to open his mouth. That's as wide as it goes. So you can imagine there's a few problems from that, right? Can't brush your teeth, can't feed yourself, can't kiss your spouse, right? We can't look in your mouth to see if your cancers come back, right? A lot of very adverse things that occur as a result of, of head and neck radiation. 